الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله uh, Last time we met we finished ayah number 214 from surah al-Baqarah which is the second surah in the Quran after al-Fatiha and it is the longest surah in the Quran Tonight we are resuming from ayah number 215 ayah number 215 starts off with a question that has been posed by the Muslims to the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah Taala is going to tell him what to answer. So here it goes. It says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ مَاذَا يُنْفِقُونَ They ask you where to spend their money. Listen carefully. Where to spend our money. Allah tells the Prophet Muhammad, قُلْ مَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَلِلْوَالِدَيْنِ وَالْأَقْرَبِينَ وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ Whatever you spend of khair means wealth, money, and resources. Whatever you spend of wealth, money, and resources, then spend it on first your parents second your relatives third the orphans fourth the destitute or the very poor and then the last one is ibn sabil which is the traveler or the wayfarer so we have one, two, three, four, five categories of people that our money, if we want to offer financial help to anyone, first we should start by covering our parents' needs. Why? Because when we were young, they spent the best of their money on us, their children. So when you grow older and your parents grow old, and you know that they need your financial help, they get to have your help before anybody else. I hope this is clear. It's simple. Then who's next? Other relatives. And who's next? Orphans who are not relatives. Okay? And very poor people. And the traveler who is stranded and he doesn't have any way to help himself. So these are the categories of people that a Muslim should consider when he or she has money to spend by way of charity. Those are the people Allah SWT is saying, give them first. A point of caution. Parents should never be given our zakat money. I repeat this. Parents should not get our zakat money. It is shameful to let your parents qualify to receive zakat. Because zakat is given normally to people who do not have food to eat, cannot pay their bills. So it is prohibited for me as a person who has money to let my parents wait for zakat. I should give them before they ask. I should cover their needs before they become that poor. This is the priority according to the Quran. So parents do not get the zakah. Zakah is paid as 2.5% on my saving. Why don't I give parents some? Because before I save, I should cover their needs. Not after I save. You see why? Okay. Likewise, you cannot pay your zakat to your children because you cannot let your children be that poor to deserve and qualify zakat money. Okay? Then the ayah goes on to say, And whatever you do of anything good, وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ Allah knows it all. Whether you spend a dollar, or $10, or $100, or $1,000. 
Allah knows. What does Allah know? Allah knows everything. So does he only know it after I counted? No, he knows before I spend, right? Definitely he knows after I spend. But why is Allah telling us that he knows? Because he wants us to be alert that the amount we spend should be relevant to the amount of blessings he has given us. So if Allah made you a millionaire or a billionaire, right? You don't come to the masjid and put five dollars in the box. A poor person could do the same. So when you spend, you spend from the wealth Allah has given you. So you spend relatively in proportion to what you have. Because Allah is watching. So Allah is alim, means he knows it all. He wants us to be alert and aware that he is watching how much he gave us and how much we spend. So a person who has means and resources, who spends minimum, Allah knows how much he gave him. Allah knows how much he should spend. So that when we spend, we factor that Allah is observing what we're doing. So this is ayah number 12, 215, I'm sorry. Then ayah number 216, it says, كتب عليكم القتال وهو كره لكم Fighting back has been prescribed for you which means has been you have been allowed now to fight back Remember we went over the ayat that talked about the rules for fighting when should a Muslim fight whom should he fight and the conditions under which he should fight and we clarified this in an issue you could get the previous session from the recorded part of this class. So here it says, because in, in the past, before this ayah came down, Muslims in Mecca were persecuted, they were killed, and Allah told them, do not push back. Hold your hands to yourself. Kufu aidiyakum. Don't fight back. So they lived through a lot of persecution, a lot of killing, their money was confiscated by the disbelievers. And at times, their children were snatched from their own hands. So here Allah is saying, fighting has been imposed on you, meaning by your enemies, because everybody has to defend themselves. So fighting in Islam, is only fighting back, which is in defense of your country, your community, your family, your religion, yourself, your friends, then you push back against injustice and aggression. So fighting has been forced on you, and Allah says, وَهُوَ كُرْهُ لَكُمْ And it is a hated issue for you. Nobody wants to fight. Nobody wants to get killed. Right? So he's saying I recognize that you hate it. But your enemies are killing you one after another. So Allah is saying I'm giving you the permission under these circumstances that you push back by fighting back against your enemies. So he says it is hated for you and then وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Maybe you hate something, but it is good for you. Because any community that does not defend itself, any country that does not have the means to defend itself, they will be taken over, they could be killed, they could be manipulated. So Allah wants the Muslim nations to be strong and to push back against aggression so that people do not take Muslims for granted. They destroy this country, they destroy that country, and all Muslims are just sitting like ducks. Islam gave the license for self-defense, which is currently embedded in international law. So this is not something that we should be afraid to clear for our friends. وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ 
maybe you hate something but it is good for you and maybe you like something that is bad for you i want to dwell on this little bit longer you know at young age younger than yours kids young kids would love to take and get what they love it doesn't matter whether it's good for them or it's not good for them so you see a two three year old trying for example to play with electric wires or plug them in right is this something that is good for them it's not good but they love it should we let them play with it the answer is no so maybe there is something that you like but it is harmful for you it's bad for you and maybe there is something that you hate but it is good for you other kids who are going to school like yourself most probably don't like to sit down and study for a long time right everybody sees studying as a chore it is something not as fun as playing but Allah is saying you may love to play you may love to slide from the top of the snow mountain to the bottom but if you do not climb the mountain you will never have the ability even to slide so what you enjoy can only come after you do what you have to do which is to climb first you have to put the effort get to the top of the mountain and then slide and enjoy yourself so to enjoy your summer vacation you have to finish your school year on a good note with good grades your parents are proud of you and you are doing something good so one of the other things that this ayah is pointing out to us is the fact that we should love what is good for us so as children we should not only love what is fun pleasant and enjoyable I should love what is beneficial and I should enjoy it. So if studying is how I become a doctor or engineer or something professional, then I have to love to study. I have to put time. I have to make my schedule. I have to control my desires. But if I let myself sleep whenever, eat whenever, play whenever, and study whenever, the study may not come to my life because it is the last thing I enjoy but if I enjoy becoming an achiever and I like to be on top of my class I like to be the first or second on my class then I will put the time and I will love it not only when I get the grades but I love putting the effort on the one hand it increases my knowledge on the other hand it puts me on top of everybody else so judging what I do and making choices between what I must do and what I want to do, I should go first for what I must do to achieve my interest. And then after I finish my duties, my homework, whatever my parents ask me to, then I can go and play and enjoy myself. But I should enjoy my interest as much as I enjoy playing and having fun. I should turn my math work into fun work. I should take, re take reading history as a fun reading. Why? It gives me information. It empowers me. So that whenever anybody tells me, oh, you Muslims have spread Islam by the sword. If I read my history, I can answer right back. But if I'm ignorant, what do I do? can do nothing so we must love what is beneficial for us and we must enjoy what is good for our interest in the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says the strong believer is better and more loved by allah than the weak believer and all of them are good right and then it goes on he says ihris ala ma yanfa'uk pursue very diligently what benefits you so if my benefit is to go to the doctor even though when he takes out my teeth it will hurt me but it is better than leaving it 
to break down all the rest of my teeth. Right? So we have to be willing to put sacrifice to accept little pain to avoid bigger pain. Which pain is bigger? To put time to study or to spend your life playing? If you spend your life playing, you will suffer for the rest of your life. But if you spend your time studying, listening to your parents, pursuing what is in your interest, you achieve a professional grade, a professional career that helps you for the rest of your life. So if we only do what we love, we are losers. If we only do what we enjoy, we become losers as well. Okay, so do not judge by, I don't like to do this. That's not the Muslim. The Muslim goes after what is beneficial, no matter how difficult the shaitan tells you it is. So why do I go for something I don't like? The only reason is if it is beneficial for me. For example, do you like to wake up from a comf the comfort of your bed? In the cold night? Do you like to wake up? No. Okay. So if you if you don't like to wake up in the cold night, because we are all comfortable in the winter to have a cover, you know, couch ourselves in the bed and enjoy the warmth, right? But Allah tells us when you hear the adhan of Fajr, wake up. Do we like to wake up then? No, we don't. But why do we do it? Because we love Allah more than we love our bed and our comfort. So for everything you say, I hate, there is something worse. And for everything you say, I love or I like or I enjoy, there is something much better. So these are the choices that if you make at your age, your life when you grow older, will be much different, much more pleasant. You know people around you, those who study for great degrees, PhD, master degree, computer science, engineering, medicine, religion, all of these people are very beneficial to themselves and to the society, right? What about people who are not up to that? What do they do? They do anything they can to provide for themselves and their family. Sometimes an engineer may work 10 hours a day, but a person who's driving a cab and making a minimum wage, he will have to drive 20 hours a day. This is much more than anybody could bear long term. So the time you're putting now to build your future is an investment that is well done. It's well spent. So don't make your choices based on your comfort. Let it be based on your interest. I think this point is made. So Allah tells us, وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah says, Allah knows and you do not know. So when Allah tells us, الصلاة خير من النوم at Fajr. And Allah says that prayer is better than you sleeping. In the Adhan, do I believe Allah? Do I respect his word? Do I respect his call? Do I love to respond to him? Do I love him to respond to me? If I do, then when he calls, I should respond so that when I call, Allah would help me with whatever I'm facing. So we cannot keep asking Allah for things and when he tells us where our interest is, we go against our own interest. So Allah is saying, Allahu ya'lam. Ya'lam what? He knows what is better for you. So whatever Allah tells you to do at a certain time, it is much better than anything else you want to do at that time. So if Allah tells you and your parents are encouraging you by 7.30 in the morning, you have to be in your school, then you must organize your life around this issue. If Allah tells us, and he does, that praying Fajr on time before sunrise requires that we wake up before sunrise, 
I must organize my life to wake up for Fajr before sunrise. So when Allah gives me an order, I have to know what does it take to execute Allah's order. Because those who obey Allah will go to paradise and we know where the rest will go. If we disobey Allah, we know where we are heading. So Allah is saying, I am telling you what is good for you. Listen to my guidance because I love you before you were created. I created the heavens and the earth for you. I helped your parents get married for you to have a chance at life. I provided for your parents so that you get what you need. Even though you may not get all what you want, but you at least get what you, what you need. So Allah is talking to us through his blessings and through the Quran and through his care for us. You go to bed, who's working your digestive system? Who's letting your heart work? Who is waking you up in the morning? So if we agree and believe what we say, that it is only Allah who wakes us up and gives us another chance at life. Every single day should never be taken for granted. So every time you go to bed, don't say tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Before you go to bed, finish your business with Allah. Pray Aisha, ask Allah to forgive you and ask Allah to give you a better day tomorrow. And repent and ask Allah to clear your page and your record. This is how you live a godly life. And it is very enjoyable life. A life in which you communicate with Allah and you pay attention to him communicating to you. When you breathe, say Alhamdulillah. When you inhale, when you exhale, say Alhamdulillah. When you open your eyes in the morning and you see the surrounding, say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah for a new day. Alhamdulillah for the capacity to see, for the capacity to hear. Don't snooze your alarm. It is like Allah is knocking on your door, inviting you to join all the people who are praying at that time. You don't want to turn the lock and Allah is asking you to wake up and he's telling you praying Fajr is better than sleeping. So I'm using those as examples and I'm, I hope I'm not overworking those examples. But the point is we should not love anything that is against our interest, no matter what it is. And we should not leave what is in our interest to do what we love. I hope the point is clear. Ayah number 217. Another question people ask the Prophet. They say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, they ask you about the holy months. You know that we explained this before when we mentioned the ayat about pilgrimage and we spoke about the months, the holy months. What are the holy months in the year? Four months in the year, fighting is prohibited. You should never initiate any fight as a nation, as an individual, as a community. You should never enjoy initiating fights. Even for a play, even for a play, playing should not be uh, inclusive of fighting. Fighting is between people who have irreconcilable interest. Okay? I want to have your oil and you want your oil for yourself. I invade your country and take the oil for myself. Then, yes, you have to fight back. Okay? And I should not invade your country to do that. But if I do, you have the right to defend yourself. If somebody wants to steal something that is yours, then you have to defend your property and your position. But it doesn't have to always be a fight and a war. If you could negotiate and get your stuff, do that. Okay? So this ayah is asking about the holy months in which fighting is prohibited because the mushrikeen attacked the, the, the muslimin during the holy month, one of the holy months. What are the holy months? The holy months are the three months of Hajj, Dhul Qi'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and Al-Muharram. 
these are three consecutive months in which fighting is prohibited. The fourth month is the month of Rajab. No, the month of Rajab. You know the battle of uh, Badr happened in, uh, in Ramadan, right? So Ramadan is a holy month in terms of fasting. But those four months, they were prohibited from the time of Ibrahim, not just when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was commissioned as a prophet. So these are time old rules that the Arabs lived by. Why did Allah make four months not to fight? Because three of those come around the season of Hajj. And in the Hajj, people took about a month to travel to get to the Hajj point, which is in Mecca. And they used to stay about a month during the Hajj. After doing the rituals of Hajj, they engage in business. Anybody who's bringing something to sell, they sell, or something to buy, they find it. So they have a month during the Hajj. And then a month back trip to back home. So it takes three months. Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, and Al Muharram. What about the month of Rajab, which is the month number seven in the lunar Islamic calendar? It comes in the middle of the year where people need to have peace so that they can travel elsewhere and do business. So it's not only during Hajj, okay? So for people to prosper and business to grow and commerce to go on and people to find the commodities and the food and the produce they need, they need some time to break away from war and violence. So this is the purpose. So when the disbelievers attacked a Muslim ally uh, during the, one of these months, Muslims started to push back and fight back because they want to protect themselves. So the mushrikeen, the, the idol worshippers, they raised an issue and said, how come you Muslims fight in the holy months as if they did not initiate the fight? So Allah answer this and I want you to hear the answer. If you have your copy of the Quran, you are welcome to open the copy and read in the language of your comfort. This is ayah number 217, surah number 2. So it says, they ask you, and ask you here means the companions of the Prophet were very hesitant to fight back because they want to respect the rules. So the Prophet Sallallahu told them, Defend yourself. That's all what it is. We're not asking you to wage a war on peaceful people. Just defend yourself. They will take you over. So they ask you regarding the holy months. Say, fighting during the holy month is an ominous major sin. But it goes on to turn people away from the path of Allah and to deny Allah and to deny people entry into the Holy Mosque of Mecca and to drive people who live there out of their homeland is greater in the sight of Allah than fighting in the Holy Month in self-defense. I hope this is clear. Should I repeat it? Should I repeat this? Anyone wants to volunteer and tell me what I said? If you say, I don't need to repeat it, somebody has to come. Anyone? No, 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 don't use your hands in the class, please. We're keep, keep, we're talking about fighting, right? <laughs> this is a mosque. Yeah, but we're not in the four months. No, but this is a mosque. Listen, there are places that Allah declares as sacred. And there are times that Allah declares as sacred, right? We have to respect both. This is a mosque, sister. Please, show respect for the place and for the setting. Thank you. Do you want me to separate you? Huh? So you will sit like adults, okay? Don't look at each other, please. So once again, I will repeat but I will ask somebody to tell me what I said. They ask you, O Prophet Muhammad, regarding the holy month and about fighting in the holy month, which is prohibited. Say, yes, 
Firing in the holy month is a grave sin, but turning people away from the path of Allah and denying Allah and denying people access to the holy mosque of Mecca and driving people away from Mecca is greater in the eyes of Allah than fighting in self-defense in any of the holy months. Is this clear? Anybody wants to volunteer? Yes. Just pushing mm -hmm. people away from the mosque and stuff is so much worse than... And I need the rest of the stuff. Um, pushing them away from the mosque. Yes. Um, Driving them out of their homeland. Yeah. And denying Allah kufr. Right? Kufr wa shirk. Kufr wa kufrun bih. A shirk no amin al kufr. Shirk is one way of being kafir, and it is the worst way. Okay, so what else? And turning people away from the mosque, as you mentioned, and driving people out of their homeland, all of these are more ominous, which means graver as sins than fighting in the holy month in self-defense. What else? Allah says, وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ What is fitna? Fitna here means persecution. Do you know what persecution is, anybody? What is persecution? Yes. Like no, asking question is not persecution. Unless you are holding somebody in detention and interrogating them to incriminate them. That is persecution also. But here, persecution means the attack on poor Muslims, right? Forcing people under the threat or use of force to change their religion. That also is persecution. That is fitna. Because you are forcing somebody to change their faith. Whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, persecution and coercion is prohibited in our faith. Nobody should be forced to change their faith under the coercion or the threat of force. So Allah is saying persecution is more grave than killing. Then the ayah goes on to say, and they are going to continue to fight you, to attack you, to commit aggression against you until they turn you away from your faith. Here it's talking about the pagans, those who made idols and worshipped them. You know about pagans and paganism, right? They will do this, the Quran says, if they can, which means if you let them do it. If you don't defend yourself, they are going to continue to persecute you until they turn you away from your own faith. And then Allah clarifies that anyone who turns away from his faith and dies as a disbeliever, those their works in this life will be rendered in vain and useless in this life and in the hereafter. So anyone who dies as a disbeliever, whatever work he has done will not have any value in this life or in the hereafter. So it raises a question. What about those who are disbelievers, but they are doing some stuff that's good? For example, they help the poor, they pave a road, yes. They'll get rewarded on earth? They will be rewarded during this life. They will be rewarded in this life, okay? But in the hereafter, they will have nothing, okay? And then it goes on to say, and those are the companions of fire, and they will be there for eternity. I want to explain eternity for you. Does anybody, did anybody study math and you know what infinity is? You know infinity, right? Yeah. So, what is the biggest number you could say? Zillion? 
zillion 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 times zillion right so whatever big number you have if you divide it into infinity what is the outcome who said zero you said zero okay no it will be a zero it is like for example when you say divide 10 over 1000 what would it be it will be three zeros points three zeros right and then 10 right so if you divide it by 10,000 if you divide it by 1 million then the zeros are going to become bigger at one point whatever number you put after all of these zeros it becomes all zero okay eternity is like infinity so if you live here 80 years or even 100 years right compare this to living for eternity which one would you rather have miserable struggling 80 years or eternity in bless and good hands with everything you wish for and what do you do in the hereafter you will have nothing she will be in heaven we cannot say that this person shall be in paradise or this person shall be in hell the only thing we could say is a pe people who do this are said in the Quran they will go to paradise people who do bad deeds and their bad deeds are greater than their good deeds they will be in hellfire but we cannot say my sister will go to hellfire or my father is going to paradise I do not know that okay so are you still up to finish the class? We have 15 minutes or less to go. Or did I put you to sleep already? I didn't put anybody to sleep? Yes. Yeah, in about 15 minutes. Okay, should we continue or are you tired? Tired. Tired or not, I will continue. Tired. Do you know why? because this is your interest we just spend a lot of time to say we must pursue our interest do you want to learn the quran yeah. okay let us go so a number 218 which we will explain and finish inshallah 218 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says amanu <laughs> وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَرْجُونَ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ Those who have believed and those who have migrated to flee away from persecution. Did, did you ever hear about the people in Rohingya? Did you ever hear about them? Rohingya. Rohingya Muslims, people in Myanmar who have been killed and persecuted and torched and burned alive have you heard about those when those migrate to run away from persecution should we not support them should we not help them we should right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying those who believe and those who migrate which means so that they can practice their faith that's the purpose right and those who fight back in the path of Allah to defend their faith, to defend their religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are seeking the mercy of Allah. That's what they are after. So people, for example, in Palestine, who are badly persecuted, right? And they are kicked out of their own homes. Their homes are being demolished and their livelihood is under the control of the occupation. Now, when they flee away to be able to practice their faith, what reward do they get? 
they get the mercy of Allah, they get the support of Allah, and they should also get our support as Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oft forgiving, oft merciful. The most merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think I will stop here so that we can entertain some of your questions because I don't want to be talking all the time, okay? So we spoke about a lot of things and I want you to have the chance to have your say and to answer the questions that you raise. Anyone wants to start, raise your hand and... Can I actually say something real quick? Yes. So uh, I was in Tafsir earlier also with uh, Dr. Hajjaj and um, uh, it hit me because you said something about parents earlier. So this is what he said. Uh, loving and caring about parents is a great action that Allah loves. Dis disobeying parents or waking up uh, or making angry even by a facial feature will make Allah angry. Allah created us similarly. Our parents brought us to life. Therefore, our obedience and being loyal to Allah must make us also obedient and loyal to our parents, as long as our obedience does not uh, lead us to disobeying Allah. <coughs> Sorry. That's something that I just wanted to make sure, because the crowd here today, I wanted to make sure you guys hear that, because this is towards you guys. Okay. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. So anyone has a question. It doesn't have to be about the ayat in particular, but any question that you want. So the, the question here is, what should we say or do about a teenager who thinks that they are not beautiful because they are either too fat or they are not as healthy as everybody else or they don't have a long hair or they don't have this kind of that well what we what we say is whatever shape Allah created you in you are unique and in your uniqueness your beauty is in your manners which will make your being beautiful see whatever beauty queen that you may look at if she doesn't have the faith if she doesn't have the good manners what beauty is this number two the other question is did she create herself to be rewarded for being beautiful and who says that she is the only one who is beautiful anyway everybody is beautiful in their own way but you increase your beauty because Allah SWT says that he has created us in the best of shapes. Best means we are all beautiful. And that's why you find people who are married. The, the, the whites are married, blacks are married, Arabs are married, uh, Chinese are married. Everybody gets married, right? Because everybody has something good about them that others desire. All what you need to do actually is not to focus on the look, but focus on the beauty that you have hands in, the beauty of your faith, the beauty of your charitable attitude, the beauty of your generosity, the beauty of your manners, then everybody would love you for who you are, not just for the picture. Okay, does this answer the question? Okay, so yes, go ahead. Ignore not only magazines that promote this kind of beauty, but ignore also TV programs, advertisements. And in fact, if you see an advertiser who is using women in particular and their body to promote any commodity, don't buy what they sell. So that they learn that they cannot manipulate women to sell stuff. There is an underlying question for this issue. The question is, I should ask myself, do I believe Allah when he said that when he created us humans, he created us in the best of shapes? And he created us in whatever image he likes. So if Allah likes you the way you are, because you are a believer, you have good manners, you are diligent, you are respectful, you are charitable, 
what else matters if Allah loves you what else matters if you value his love then nobody should compete with him on your heart love Allah as he loves you and Allah will continue to love you even more a Muslim could be a disobedient Muslim not every sin will turn somebody into a non-Muslim Muslim scholars never agreed to this idea that if somebody violates or did a sin that he becomes non-Muslim no 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 but, but you said she continued to claim that she is a Muslim she has the right to continue to claim if she is living by the rest of Islam right she is a Muslim but she is in disobedience she doesn't like what Allah made of her yes Islam is an expression of my faith faith is to believe so Islam is a show of faith in what way do we show our faith by praying by testifying there is no God but Allah and Muhammad Rasulullah we fast Ramadan we pray we make zakah we make Hajj we treat people well that is Islam okay Iman is how much faith you have in your heart and how much discipline in your life. You see the difference?